I give a lot of credit, obviously, to Sam for creating this lesson. And Sam has been with the Miracle Group about a year and a half now, I guess. And he's uh, done some amazing work. He helped edit some of the lessons that the last Miracle Cohort the folks uh, uh, gave to us. And he also has written kind of another lesson. So this one he's entitled Discovering Climate Variability. So let's see what's up. First of all, objectives. The objectives are to identify relationships between environmental and demographic data, spatial patterns. And those of you who are science teachers uh, currently practicing in the classroom, uh, you would certainly recognize this idea of patterns as being an important element of Michigan science standards. And so as Sam was developing the lesson, he did have those science standards in mind, but also social studies as well and technology. Second effect would be to analyze the impacts of climate change and human vulnerability to its impacts in Michigan. And thirdly, students will familiarize themselves with online spatial data sets. So there's just some absolutely great data sets out there that are both national and international, but it's really something I think that's super important for our students to actually see some of these kind of real world data sets and visualizations. And finally, the last one is a student kind of will develop a fictional story, uh, predicts future outcomes to cap their understanding of climate change. So these are kind of the big main objectives for this lesson, which was developed for high school students. As, as Sam and I were talking and the rest of the group Perhaps this could even be used at the undergraduate level in college because it's, it's that kind of powerful a lesson. Now, as I mentioned, uh, science standards were in the, the front of Sam's mind as he was preparing the lesson and the specific performance expectation is one for high school and using this computational representation to illustrate relationships among Earth systems and how these are being modified due to human activity. Lesson itself is developed through a 5E model. And those of you who are educators, uh, particularly in the science world, uh, definitely are familiar with the 5E e model, which is engage, elaborate, explain, all that. So we'll go through kind of each lesson part in a kind of a, a big way. And then the details will be shared afterwards. We actually take a look at the lesson and that will be explained exactly like all of uh, resources and things that are involved in the lesson. So uh, we're going to start with the idea of engage. So you have to find in this idea of engagement, something that kind of spurs interest among the students. And so what's going to happen with the engage part is that the teacher really will kind of be handling this, although uh, the students could probably jump in as well, providing some examples uh, more specifically of what they've seen about climate change. 
But this is an example of how Sam designed the lesson. And he's starting with the IPCC Interactive Atlas. It's a pretty neat website. Uh, it, it takes a little bit of understanding of how to work with it, but um, there's lots of guidance there, for sure. And what you're able to do is look at various parameters and you're uh, able to look at, for instance, a one degree projection of temperature change, 1.5, 3, whatever. And then you're able to make art like this or visual like this. Uh, for, for instance, the left-hand side, this is for 1.5 degree increase in temperature. And the one to the right is three degrees. And you can actually take these visuals and bind them together. So the left-hand side was created and then you kind of hit a magic button and you're able to create the left-hand side, you know, as well. So you have really good comparisons. You have to the left then showing you anticipated change in temperature. And as you're working with these graphs, you can, or you, these charts, you can zoom in and out. So I, I zoomed in a bit. So show the North American continent, a little bit of Europe and also Africa. So the chart to the left uh, that gives you some idea of what that temperature change might be in these various scenarios. The lighter colors, you have, um, you know, up to about two degrees or so, and then uh, the deep dark colors talking perhaps six degrees. So those are potential changes if kind of like the overall Earth's surface was going up 1.5 or either uh, 1.5 or 3. Another visual that there are different directions for creating. This one is total precipitation. And the scale on the left, what that's saying to you is the percentage increase or percentage decrease. And overall, you can see that there's an anticipated increase in precipitation over much of our continent, but certainly to the south. Now, with both these, there are a number of, of different questions that could be posed to the students, which would be like, what are you noticing about these maps? Kind of doing a comparison types of things, looking at the trends and uh, locations that might stand out, similarities, differences. Then kind of going into well, how do you think these temperature changes might affect us as humans or precipitation? How's it going to affect personally, and your school, your family, your home, your food, and who would be the most effective? So are you getting into that uh, vulnerable populations? And who in Michigan might be most effective and why? So there are lots of iterations that you could use on this particular website. So here's another example. And this example is the consecutive dry days. And you can see there's, there's definitely a, a difference in number of dry days as you go south. So that's a little bit of what we're doing in the Engage, but it continues with a really great uh, website. It's a NASA site and it's it's called uh, Vital Signs of the Environment and it's part of their Global Climate Change Initiative. And this has a whole different set of pictures. Uh, so these visualizations uh, can have 
a look at sea ice, sea level, carbon dioxide, global temperature, and this is just one of the many visualizations on that website. But I think one of the more interesting one would be actually these interactive ones. So if you look down at the bottom, if you click on the, the spot to the lower left, you're going to be able to see temperature change uh, throughout time from 1884 to 2020. So that's, it's kind of a, a pretty powerful thing to be looking at. Well, we're a little far removed from uh, kind of like the vulnerability and all that. So kind of circling back to that, in the explore section of the lesson, we have a, a very interesting comparison with two cities in the state of Michigan. The first one um, is Detroit, and the second one is Manistique. So not Manistee, but Manistique is in the Upper Peninsula. So what we're doing in the exploring part is uh, there's a really nice exploring vulnerability packet that has been created for the lesson. And the students will work through and look at these two Michigan cities to explore the relative vulnerability in each one, you know, with an eye to potential climate change. One of the uh, suggestions before you use this part of the lesson is to have your students do some research on Detroit and on Manistique and really kind of get to know those two things. Once they've done that preliminary research, uh, research they'll be able to, I think, dive in and really uh, get at the different vulnerabilities in these two cities. So here's uh, downtown Detroit and then a little bit uh, south of downtown, uh, you have uh, Detroit Water and Sewage Plant. And there's something called Zing Island. It looks kind of nasty, I guess. Uh, but of course, Detroit's right across from Canada. And as if you look at Canada, what's happening along that shoreline, I suppose it's not uh, terribly scenic. <laughs> Manistique, though. It's a relatively small city, and you have a kind of a shot of the main street, very, very different from Detroit. And then you have also the Google Earth. There's a river that comes kind of right through town. Uh, that, that white that you see kind of uh, near the upper left of the diagram, that's actually part of a paper mill. And that paper mill actually was polluting uh, the river system. It is uh, all cleaned up now. But the city itself is on the right. So you see it's tiny. So the, the suggestion with the lesson is to really have the students drill down and take a look at what's going on with these two areas. For the top part, these are some statistics for Detroit and the bottom, Manistique. And these are generated very easily through the Census Bureau, U.S. Census Bureau. But if you look, for instance, at the income, 21,000 versus 19,000 in Manistique, so actually higher income in the Detroit area. Um, if you look at, uh, for instance, the poverty level. So the poverty level in Detroit is 30.6%. It's only 23.7%, which is pretty amazing if their income isn't as great. And some other things that are, would be the ethnic composition of those two areas. And you can see that these two areas are clearly different in that composition. So the next uh, 
part of what we have here is after they have done this vulnerability packet, they're going to be uncovering all sorts of ideas and they're going to be exploring the differences between the two cities. And I think uh, what's kind of interesting is in the Detroit area, something comes up that's kind of crucial to our populations there, and that's that her urban heat island uh, profile effect. As you can see that cities are generally warmer. So the students go through and they compare and contrast and, and learn a lot about um, you know, our main themes. So then as we go into the explain part of the lesson, so basically these should be very familiar to you. Uh, so exposure and sensitivity and adaptive capacity and some of the things that are going to be affecting all three of those very, very important concepts that are going to relate to climate change. So after explaining, uh, the next phase of the lesson is what's known as elaborate. And in the elaboration, I think this is this is really a, a very cool tie-in because students are going to be developing their own fictional story uh, based on the future. They can someplace in again or another part of the world. They think ahead what's going to happen in four years from now and what impact it's going to have on the character story. There's also suggestions for books that students could look at to kind of inspire them with their stories. But again, focusing on the character's vulnerability and the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So after they have um, created their stories, the last part of 5e lesson is to evaluate. And there is a rubric provided for the story in the resources for the project and also some formative assessment ideas. And so by the end of this lesson, which Sam suggests could take, uh, you know, up to days, I, I don't imagine every day would have like the same amount of time, but uh, certainly kind of developing the story and having the students do the research and all that easily take that much time. So that is uh, what I have for what's going on with the general aspect of the lesson. So I'm going to turn it over to Elena and she's going to fill in a, a few of more of the details. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Janet. And um, as we are, we, are, we kind of promised to finish this uh, session at 5.15, so we're very close. And um, um, I wanted to encourage you all to send us a few questions. So if you have any questions right now, uh, put them in the q and a and uh, we will brainstorm them together. Um, otherwise, uh, join us next Thursday. So remember that every second Thursday of the month, we are having just Zoom discussion plays and brainstorming lesson plans and activities and how incorporate all these concepts in your classroom when we can have super in kind of informal discussion without presentations. So if you feel like you need to think a little bit and then come up with your questions in a week, uh, then we will just send you a Zoom link for the meeting and we will see you there and we will come together to talk. Uh, if you have any questions right now, if you have burning questions that you want us to brainstorm with you, uh, send them please through the Q&A. So with this, we will just give you one minute Elena, I would like to um, just encourage um, all of the uh, teachers and to um, really um, engage with this um, education piece, especially for 
um, students that live in vulnerable areas, uh, lest you sort of bring this information to them as oftentimes, um, you know, these harms or these issues are in their own backyards and they often aren't exposed to this information uh, other than a teacher teaching a lesson or them learning in that way. So I really encourage you to engage um, with this uh, education piece here and um, others as part of this um, program. Well, thank you all. Uh, I see the question coming in through the Q&A. So uh, John Forston is asking, would it be a, too a stretch uh, to allocate uh, excess death due to carbon pollution? worldwide 9 million pro rate based on local population, for example. Um, not sure if I fully understand questions. So once again, would it be true a stretch to allocate excess deaths due to carbon pollution? I think that's a great question. What yeah. John is wondering is, um, you know, would it be, um, I think it's an important question, you know, to allocate, you know, the excess deaths um, that are due to uh, carbon pollution. Uh, so, so again, um, it, it, it's a matter of how you engage with the actual lesson plan yourself. But I think it's important that uh, we do include um, what deaths occur due to carbon pollution. In fact, um, we could even stretch that a little bit further when we talk about other um, sort of desperate uh, impacts uh, such as uh, the COVID virus and issues uh, such as that. But yes, yeah, so that that's a really good question, John. And also I like um, the information that you provided here that worldwide um, 9 million and, and that we should base this information on local population. I hope I'm capturing that uh, correctly, but I, I think that's an excellent point. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank well, you, let me jump in a little bit. Um, the the term carbon pollution. I mean, I'm assuming that you know you're thinking about greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide and and all of that. But um, as for the effect on temperature, if you go back to that like visual of the urban heat island. Uh, for instance, if we have more hot days, uh, like folks in uh, are very vulnerable if they don't have any kind of cooling center or air conditioning, and if they don't have the resources or whatever, uh, there are definitely uh, documented deaths of that uh, happening. And also the rising sea level, if you have um, increasing extreme weather events and you're right uh, at sea level, definitely people have perished because of that as well. Out of time. So thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.